Thank you. Um, the uh, fall of the House of Usher, this is the event breakdown as asked for by Dr. Garavi. Um, for me, this is the essence of what makes this story this story. It, what ex it's what excites me as an artist in terms of this group of people. And please note that I do use, uh, both in the visuals and in the text, I do use he and she. But of course, uh, gender has no uh, bearing on, on where this eventually goes. There are twins, and one of them falls ill. The healthier twin sends for his childhood friend for comfort and companionship. The childhood friend has a full day's journey to the house. Thank you. The childhood friend encounters the house and its reflection. Now, encounter to me is a very active word. It very much inspires my imagination. Encounter is a core vocabulary word that I use in the clown class, and it's a word that I use every day in my mind. The childhood friend encounters the healthier twin and learns the nature of the strange illness. In this moment, we plant the seed of what will eventually kill the healthier twin. And I believe this is important to what makes this story this story. In the post specifically, it's the sensitivity being overwhelmed by fear. But it's the fact that the nature of the, the, nature of the illness is linked to the nature of the external killing factor. The twins are also linked to the house that the childhood friend encountered. The ill twin succumbs to her illness, and the childhood friend and healthy twin fill the time creating musical and visual and literary art. Then, the ill twin dies, supposedly, and the childhood friend and living twin entomb the dead twin in the vault. But, unbeknownst to the childhood friend and the audience, the dead twin is waking and escaping from the vault. This next one, again, to me, is active. It's the angst and agitation of the living twin intensifies, because it is ultimately a lead-up to the explosion in a physical and metaphorical storm with magical properties. Childhood friend attempts to calm the living twin with a reading of a popular schlocky tale that parallels the hidden action of the undead twin's final moments of escape. The living twin admits that he was aware his twin was still alive when he entombed her. And then the undead twin bursts into the room and the living twin dies in her embrace. The house that was encountered by the childhood friend collapses with the death of the twins as the childhood friend makes his escape. <laughs> now, or that is. The, I, I, now I, I ask two more minutes. Uh, in terms of something Julie brought up, the uh, certain kind of a pop culture sensibility being applied to this, it's bad science, but I think what that leaves us open to is a discovery of the good science and how the good science can actually change some of this stuff. I would like to make a note of just a couple things that could take us to bad science. Um, in our working title, we have a few words that are meaningful to me, fall, house, and Mobius. Fall and house have a number of meanings, perhaps interchangeable. Rep is short for reputation here. Is this the bad science? This is, well, we're getting into the bad science. Is this is associated. This is just, uh, just a, a quick association. And then the Mobius strip, having a, a num, uh, um, an interesting topography and being a bit of a physical anomaly. Um, one of the things I noticed about a Mobius strip is it can be used to describe the grandfather paradox. And I would like to discuss the grandfather paradox very quickly in terms of this man. 
According to uh, Albert Einstein's special uh, theory of special relativity, future word time travel is completely possible and not controversial among scientists. We can go forward into time, and we do it at a micro level all the time. <laughs> Password time travel is more problematic because of things like the grandfather paradox. Right. I made a little slip of paper. All right? Follow along. On the pink side, we have a timeline. At the beginning of this timeline, Einstein lives. Einstein has a child. It's a girl child. Okay? His girl child was born, and then they had to give her up. Abandoned, right? We learned this from, from Chelsea. Okay? Let's say hypothetically that she lived. They assume that she died. But let's assume that she lived. If she lived, she had a really, really horrible Fantine-like existence, for those of you who know Lady Zorab. Okay? And that at a certain point in her life, she gives birth to a child. Child B. That child B's life is even worse. Really, really difficult. Through some deus ex machina, child B learns of his or her link to Albert Einstein. So child B travels back in time to shoot and kill Albert Einstein to prevent the pain that he or she feels. That's my pink timeline. On the blue timeline, it begins with Einstein being dead, because Einstein was shot and killed. If you do it at the right time, child A is never born. Therefore, child B will never be born. Therefore, nobody will travel to, through time to shoot and kill Albert Einstein. Therefore, Einstein lives. Wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, if time were like a coin, like Matthew's coin last week, right, where heads or tails is always up, but time isn't like a coin, right? Yes, blue can never be pink, but time is not a coin. Time can bend. Time can loop. Time can twist. We just made these. Mine is pink and blue. So let's look at our timeline now, OK? Let's start with uh, pink. Einstein lives. Child A is born. Child B is born. Child B discovers the lineage, travels back in time to kill Einstein. Einstein is dead. Child A is never born. Child B is never born. Nobody travels through time to kill Einstein. Therefore, Einstein lives. We have a time loop, which is inherently paradoxical. Yeah. Um, so if I were to read this enough times, Right? Einstein lives, Einstein dies. Einstein lives, Einstein dies. And we take an aggregate of all the experiments. Einstein is dead 50% of the time, and he lives 50% of the time. Therefore, if I did this hidden, I, I went through it. I said, is Einstein dead or alive? It's a 50-50 shot. Wait a second. 50% chance of being alive, 50% chance of being dead? Where have I heard that before? Schrodinger's. Schrodinger's. You can Right? Schrodinger's kitty cat. The cat is also alive 50% of the time in experiments, dead 50% of the time in experiments, and the scientist does not know which is true until the box is opened and the cat is observed. But it's bad science to call this a paradox, because it's not a paradox. It is, however, commonly interpreted as a paradox. Right? And I can talk about how uh, the uncertainty principle can also be uh, thought about in terms of pop culture itself. Yes. Um, but you know who did love paradoxes? M.C. Escher. He loved himself some paradoxes. This ascending and descending, that's a paradox. And in fact, it's based on a drawing by a guy named Penrose, who was a scientist. Right? He sent this to, to Escher. And, well, he sent a, a, the Penrose Triangle, which is, uh, well, that's the Penrose Triangle. We saw those before in Audie's presentation. And then he did a, an ascending and descending a triangle as well. He sent it to Escher, and Escher turned it into this and put the little monks in it. You know? So if you continue going around the stairs, you go down and down and down and down in a loop. It cannot physically exist. So if hypothetically we were to choose to go with the popular interpretation of things like the uncertainty principle, Schrodinger's cat, we have a situation in which the cat is both alive and dead. Alive and dead at the same time. Where have I heard that before? Oh, yeah, the undead. 
They are both alive and dead at the same time. And where else in our source material do we have a person who is alive and dead at the same time? Madeline. At the moment she is entombed, she is both alive and dead. She is being treated as if dead. She appears to be dead. Her symptoms are of death, and yet she lives. But what of Roderick? Roderick comes from an ancient family with a peculiar sensibility of temperament, cadaverous complexion, a ghostly complexion, a luminous eye, miraculous luster of the eye, beautiful thin lips, wild floating hair, all exaggerated to inhuman appearance. Now, I'm not saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> and finally, let me remind you all of things that appear impossible. In the everyday world. The quantum world. And in my magical world. Are an everyday occurrence. Maybe that's something we can bring out. As well.